we're live on YouTube. Are they receiving? Hey, South Dakota. Hey, hey how y'all been? How you doing? Can you hear us in South Dakota? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? Absolutely. Is this what you were looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, now. That big flat. Okay, let me make their screen bigger. Um, Did you tell them you're lecturing today? No. Okay, you're going to be able to see the students from here. Um, and let me attend to this mess. Yes, you should have. Nobody tried to connect to my jam box and play music, okay? Not unless it's something really good. Yeah, jam boxes are awesome. Uh, don't buy beats, don't buy all tag, buy jam box. Because you can plug auxiliary audio in and last eight or ten hours. Or you can Bluetooth it for like two days. Wow. And it's really loud. Okay, your volume to for this is there and there. So they are probably too loud, but that's okay. So what is coming out of this then? Them. Just them. Yeah. What if they want to jam? Plan on keeping our microphones muted like 90% of the time, but if you have any time for question and answer breaks or if you guys do a Q&A section at the end of the class, we should be able to talk at you and um, respond to Corporal. Tell them you don't have an operator to do that from where it is. He can hear you. So we don't have an operator to do that, uh, but if, they, if we can hear the questions and I can answer them, I'm sorry, was that directed at us? Was that question for us? Yes. Yes. Finally got my keys. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I see what you wrote on there. <laughs> Outlaw State University. Mm hmm. Well, that's because, you know, oh, you. There is no such thing as OU, Oklahoma Sooners, per se, because they have to lease OU from Ohio State University. It's a trademark logo. So they can only use it in certain states, and whenever they play uh, in their regional areas, there's some other kind of agreement that comes into play, but o OU pays Ohio State University a royalty fee for everything that says OU. It's just a different color. So this is OSU. I know, I know so. Well, there it is. You can see their students, and they'll be able to hear you. And uh, awesome. I got it. Um, we will also be able to ask any questions if you guys have a question and answer period during the class. Um, we'll unmute our microphones and respond to you guys then. Okay, uh, tell them welcome. they're welcome to chime in at any time. If they need yeah, to. I was going to say, have them ask the questions as they come up so they don't need to wait till the end. There's a 13 second delay. Okay, that's fine. I'll let them know. We can ask you. And I'm told that I should tell you that there's a 13 second delay. Possibly. Possibly. <clears throat> um, I, I believe that 13 second delay is probably on the YouTube broadcast. It doesn't seem to have any delay on this YouTube. Great.
be one from three cameras. That's all. They can only see up here. What, are you going to make faces at me while I'm up here? Will you be able to see the laptop at that degree of angle of Should be able tip to, yeah. when you're standing up? So it's a new laptop, right? It's yours. It's your new one. You bought it. I spent well over $1,000 for that. Where'd you get it? Uh, Best Buy. And yes, I've kept the reward points. <laughs> Hey, I'm not going to lie to you. Sorry, right. when we travel, we keep the points, too. This thing can do everything. It's, uh, it's got to do everything you can think of. Man. Wait, this is scary. Start. I'm using that. I have to have a MAC address that I can read. And that's all the computers here in the building have to be on Wi-Fi for student use. Uh, it's a security protocol. However, if I want to plug something in, I have to have an exterior or a... a uh, a device that has its own MAC address so that they can no, allow the firewall. So, so and that also had to have uh, that also had to be you know put in the permissions list. So. <laughs> can I vaporize that? Why do you want to vaporize it? To make the pump pass a whole lot more fun. This is true. I took chemistry. That's scary too. Uh-huh. Yeah. You're not just talking to some dumb broadcast guy in here. <laughs> yeah, what day did he tell you? I don't I don't he didn't tell me. It shouldn't be an odd number, though. We well, can like, like next week in a class. Okay. All right, we'll make it Thursday. If there's some confusion, we'll make it Thursday. Okay. The homework for me will be due a week from today. <laughs> okay. Do any of your slides have video or audio on huh? Yes. Check, check, one, two. Can I get you to, to say hi? Hello, check, check. Check, check. Check, check. started that, that we are now completely interactive and that Dakota can hear the students' uh, questions somewhat, but we'll also be able to hear their interactions just so they know, kind of like a release saying, hey, you know, your voices are being trained, and they know that already. And I'll try to repeat any questions that I get. Yes, do that. And I'll, if not, I'll, uh, I have a nerf gun over here. Give me a big question mark. Yeah. I got a nerf gun
tried to fix the clock, and when you take it off, it's there's nothing to adjust. It's got it's got something plugged into it, and you can't adjust it. It's a master clock. Master clocks are that way, and that's a slave clock, yeah. or shall we say, a daughter clock. So we don't well, I don't know how you get it to the right time, but it's not the right time. <laughs> I'll fix it later. You watch. At I thought it would happen. At some point in time, it's half price twice a day because it's on the middle. I'm not even sure if it's moving. I think it's been the same time since we got here. No, it's ticking. It's ticking, but I don't see the, the hands moving because I think it's the same time. It's kind of like when you lecture, but see you move around with you know. You hear, you see a lot of hot air, but nothing coming out. This is a hot air balloon. I can say no problem. All right, time. No. Oh, yeah. You don't think it was a hot air balloon. I can say no Let me know when you're ready to go. Obviously. I'm ready. So did you guys have a good Labor Day holiday? It was like me, it was too short, it feels like it went too fast, didn't get as much done as you hoped to get done, the usual, right? There was a little bit of confusion about homework too when it's due, whether it was due today or Thursday, so just to make sure nobody's confused, we'll make it due on Thursday. So homework number two on Thursday and send that, email that to AJ. If you forget and print it out, then give it to the instructor on Thursday and he'll give it to AJ. The homework that I'm going to give you today will be due a week, week from today, so next Tuesday. Schedule then, we're going to go through NOx today. You had general pollution emissions on last Thursday. Then this Thursday, you're going to have a special topic, post-combustion treatment. We're actually flying in the instructor from California, so you guys are special. Then heat transfer, I'm going to do next Thursday and flare radiation, sorry, next Tuesday, and then flare radiation you'll have next Thursday. Any questions on the schedule? All right, and I can now see the students from South Dakota. Presumably they can see me and hear me. All right, they're waving, that's good. <laughs> and they can ask questions now if they have questions. So anybody, both either school, ask the questions as they come up. You don't need to wait till the end. Go ahead and ask it when you think about it. All right, so today we're going to talk about NOx emissions. Stephen briefly touched on that last time. This is an important enough topic that we give a whole lecture to it. It's really probably one of the more important pollutants in the United States these days. So we have quite a bit of information on that. After we're done this session then, you should be able to list the three major mechanisms for NOx. It's going to turn out there are actually more than that, but we'll talk about the three more important ones. How do you measure NOx? How do you correct it to a certain O2? And that's going to be one set of your homework problems is converting to a certain O2 level. Another part of your homework is going to be the next bullet, which is converting NOx from PPM to pounds per million. And then the last one, we'll probably spend most of the time today talking about strategies for reducing NOx. We've actually come quite a long way. I'm going to show you a little bit of history where NOx was when the Clean Air Act was passed in the United States in 1970 to where we are today. So pretty big reduction in that. So here's the outline we're going to go through today. First, the NOx types and importance. How is NOx formed? What are the ambient effects on NOx, meaning what about the temperature and humidity in the air? Do they have any impact on NOx? NOx measurement and reporting. And then again, the last one, NOx control, which we'll spend most of our time on today. There are at least five different kinds of NOx, combinations of nitrogen and oxygen. Three of them are of interest to us. The most important one to us is nitric oxide, or NO. People estimate that about 90% of the emissions that come out of a process heater are in the form of nitric oxide. The next one is nitrogen dioxide, or NO2. Only about 10% or so is NO2 that comes out of the stack. However, interestingly, the regulators often ask the people that are generating these emissions to convert them all to NO2. And the reason is that NO, when it goes into the atmosphere, after a few days, it converts to NO2. So the regulators assume that's going to happen, so they ask it to be reported as NO2. What that means then is NO is a slightly lighter molecule, so when you convert it to NO2, you're actually reporting more NOx coming out by mass than you actually had, with the assumption, again, that it's going to convert in the atmosphere. And then the last one, Nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, actually has only been measured, to my knowledge, in laboratory flames. The reason we talk about it is it actually has some bad things associated with it. 
We do not measure this today in industrial flames. Someday, maybe the government will ask us to do that, but for the moment, we're not measuring that. It is in very small quantities, typically parts per billion, which again makes it hard to measure. The first two are typically in parts per million, also fairly small. So nitric oxide was actually the molecule of the year, according to Chemical Engineering Magazine, in 1992. It actually has some good things associated with it. We're going to talk about the bad things associated with it today, but you can actually buy nitric oxide in pill form. And it's especially good for guys. You can read why it's good for guys. But it's supposed to be good for your health. I've not taken this myself, so I can't verify that. But again, there are some actually good things about it when it's in the atmosphere, not so good for us. So again, in coming out of a process heater or furnace, roughly 90 to 95% of it is NO, and the balance is NO2. Why this is important is if you have an older style portable analyzer, the old ones actually only measured NO, and they reported NO and NO2, and they used this calculation of 10% NO2. So if a company has an older one, they need to know they're not actually measuring the second one, it's a calculation. Today's analyzers, you can measure both of them if you want to, or you just get an analyzer that measures one or the other, but in the old days, or the older ones actually did the calculation. When you fire on gas, the older technologies, before we tried to reduce NOx, made approximately 100 to 150 ppm of NOx. We're going to see how well we've done compared to that. Again, this was pre-1970 when the Clean Air Act was passed in the United States. Today, we're much lower than that. In fact, we're an order of magnitude lower than that. So we'll see where we're at today. That's firing on gas. If you were to fire on oil, you actually typically make more NOx. The reason is that oil often has organically bound nitrogen in it. That nitrogen comes off very easily. So we're not talking about N2. It's actually something like ammonia, which would be NH3. So again, that nitrogen atom comes off very easily and makes NOx very easily. So if we have to make a guarantee, for example, and somebody's firing an oil, we have to know what the oil's made out of before we can make a guarantee. And I'm going to show you some data later that there's a, a very strong influence on how much nitrogen is in the oil. In the United States, hardly anybody fires oil anymore because it makes too much pollution. We had an inquiry a couple months ago from a refinery in Hawaii. Needless to say, we're not going to have any trouble getting people to volunteer to go there. They are firing oil. Any guess as to why they might be firing oil in Hawaii? That's what they can get, right? They can ship it in and they can get it. Similarly, in the Caribbean, lots of those refineries are also firing oil. They're typically firing some heavy, nasty stuff, very sour crude, because it's cheap. And again, it's easy to get on an island. So not so easy to get natural gas there, but pretty easy to get oil there. So NOx on oil burners is more. It could be several times more than it would have been on gas. Now, why do we care about NOx? What's the big deal? You heard before that it, in some respects it's good for us. Well, it also has some bad things when you breathe it in. So one of the things that's bad is it inhibits respiratory function, damages vegetation. It combines with moisture in the atmosphere, so clouds, rain, snow, things like that, to make nitric acid. That's one of the acid rain components. It contributes to harmful ozone formation. If you've lived in Tulsa for a while, if you've been here in the summer, you've seen some ozone alert days. So ozone alert days are typically when it's very hot and not much wind. This summer, I don't think, I'm not sure if we've had any of them. I haven't been here all summer, but I'm not sure if we've had any. But a few summers ago, we had a lot of them. In fact, we exceeded our allowances for that summer and the summer after that. The last few summers have been pretty good. They haven't been as hot and they've been pretty windy. But the problem is with NOx, it combines with volatile organic compounds and high temperatures to make ozone. So we don't like ozone down here because it's bad for our breathing. If you're a baby, if you have asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, you're elderly, anybody with breathing difficulties, ozone down here, which again is O3, is bad for us. It's a very aggressive oxidant. 
However, we do like ozone in the upper atmosphere. Why is it good up there? What's it do up there that's good for us? It absorbs UV energy from the sun. It shields us from a lot of the UV, so it's good up there. And one of the problems with N2O, nitrous oxide, is it's a depleter of ozone in the upper atmosphere. So a lot of things that are bad about NOx, very heavily regulated. California probably has the toughest in the world. They usually lead the world in their emissions. They have a new regulation that just came out not too long ago for boilers in, NOx, in uh, California. So any new boilers there have to be sub 5 ppm. Very difficult to do for just the burners. Our sister company, Cohen, you're going to hear about them later in the course. They do have a burner that can do that with just the burner alone. But what you're going to hear on Thursday are some other things that you can do if you can't get low enough with the burners. So post-treatment where you have to take it out after the fact. <clears throat> so NOx formation, frankly, the regulators don't care how it was formed. But for us to know that, we can do something about it. So we'll see what are some important things that influence NOx. Well, it's a combination, obviously, of nitrogen and oxygen. There are five mechanisms for forming different kinds of NOx. We'll see that the first three of them are really of interest to us. The other two are in, of interest to other kinds of combustion processes, but not the ones that we're dealing with here. So if you look at fuel NOx, it's a pretty complicated reaction. It's a reaction where you have organically bound nitrogen in the fuel. And some examples, again, would be heavy oils or residual oils. So in that case, the nitrogen atom comes off very easily. In the case of N2, you know, that's in air, that N2 is a very stable molecule. It's a triple bond. It's hard to break it. But when you have it organically bound, it comes off very easily, and it makes NOx very easily. So that's an important one. Thermal NOx is probably the most important one for us. Thermal means temperature. And we're going to see a graph of that, that as the temperature goes up, the NOx goes up faster and faster. And we're going to talk about what are some of the things that increase the temperature in a combustion process. Some of these we can control, some of them we can't. So we'll see what do we have control over that we can change and what don't we. Prompt NOx not nearly as significant normally as thermal NOx, also a complicated reaction similar to fuel NOx. However, in this case, it's not because it's organically bound. It's actually just the reactions that are going on. The reason it's called prompt NOx is it happens very quickly right at the beginning of the flame. Again, not as significant normally as thermal NOx. Fuel NOx depends if you have a fuel that has that kind of organically bound in it or not. Next one is Recombination reactions, these only happen for high-pressure flames. Internal combustion engines, gas turbines, not of importance to us because our processes that we're talking about in this course are atmospheric pressure. So we don't worry about this one. It is a combustion one, but only at high pressures. And then the last one, NNH, you need very high temperatures for that. Again, not of interest in this course. It is from combustion. It would be if you replaced pure air with pure oxygen. You get a much hotter flame, and then you would care about this mechanism. So for our purposes, the first three are of interest to us. So let's see what some of the things are that impact NOx. We'll talk about each of these. We'll show you some graphs of them and then talk about them. So the first one is the temperature. You can think of it as the flame temperature. You can think of it as the furnace temperature basically what the flame gases are going to see. This plot is showing the gas temperature, again, you can think of it like the flame temperature, versus the predicted NOx in parts per million by volume on a dry basis, so PPMVD. And it's for three different fuels, hydrogen, methane, and propane. All three of them show you the same thing, that NOx goes up faster and faster as the temperature increases. Exponential dependence, the end point for each curve is the adiabatic flame temperature for that fuel. The reason why hydrogen is so high on the graph is it has the highest adiabatic flame temperature of these three fuels. So this says that anything that's going to drive the temperature up is not going to be good for NOx. Now, what are some of those things? Well, one of them is having a lot of hydrogen in your fuel. 
that has a higher flame temperature, it's typically going to make more knocks. Another thing that's going to drive it up is the furnace temperature itself. In a glass furnace, they are about 3,000 degrees. Really, really hot. If you want to make NOx, go to a glass furnace. That's how you do it. They have a big problem trying to reduce it. Another thing that can impact it is the, the operating conditions. So if you, had, uh, if you didn't have something to absorb a lot of the heat, that can be an issue. Uh, another thing that can impact it is air preheat. So if you preheat the combustion air going into the process, that's good for efficiency, really bad for NOx. So some of these things we can control, some of them we can't. Could you say in a glass furnace, well, let's just reduce the temperature by 500 degrees, right? We can't do that because then we won't be able to make the glass. They're not making it 3,000 degrees for the heck of it. They're doing it because that's how hot it needs to be. How about can we take hydrogen out of the fuel? Yeah, you could. Is it economical to do that? Probably not. You can do it. We technically can do it. We know how to do it. But does it make economic sense? Probably not. Question? Does the NOx itself come from nitrogen in the air or nitrogen in the fuel for a combination of both? So the question is, where does the NOx get its nitrogen from? If you look at air, air is roughly 21% by volume, oxygen about 79% by volume, nitrogen. So we've got a lot of nitrogen available. Some fuels also have some nitrogen in them in the form of N2. So, for example, natural gas in Tulsa, we have a little bit of nitrogen in our fuel, uh, probably less than half a percent. So it's pretty small. So the NOx gets it from either place. They're both N2. It doesn't care where it came from, if it's the fuel or the air. Obviously, most of it's coming from the air, but it can get it from either place. So, yes, e either one. All right, so temperature, that's a big deal. The next thing that also impacts NOx is the air-fuel ratio. If we look at the case where it's 0% excess air, that would be stoichiometric conditions. So there, we theoretically have exactly the right amount of fuel and air. We don't run there because real equipment, we can't mix it perfectly enough to work there. So we normally run with a little bit of excess air. For gas firing, the typical number is about 15% excess air. How's that for NOx? That's the very worst place you can be for NOx. Now, why? Well, let's look at the extremes first. If we look at the case where we have lots of extra air, in this case, double the amount of air that we need, all that extra air sucks up heat, lowers the flame temperature, lowers the NOx. Good, right? However, all this extra air sucks up heat and carries a lot of energy out the stack. So normally, you don't want to have 100% extra. You don't have double the amount of air. Bad for efficiency. How about the other side? It seems weird to say minus excess air. It just means we don't have any excess air. In fact, we're deficient about that much. Now, why is it good on the fuel-rich side for NOx? Well, really for two reasons. One is lower temperatures over there because if you don't give it enough air, you don't burn all the fuel, lower temperature. The other reason it's lower is for chemistry. Hydrogen is much more reactive than carbon, so hydrogen gets its oxygen first. Whatever it needs for combustion, it gets it. Whatever it's left over, carbon gets it next, nitrogen's last. Now, what happens on this side is we've burned all the carbon, we burn all the hydrogen, we ha now have some extra oxygen left over, and we have high temperatures. You need all of those to make NOx. So again, that's the worst place, and that's really where we want to run. So what do we do? We run part of the flame fuel lean, part of the flame fuel rich. So the average is where we want it to be, but we try not to have any part of the flame at that ratio because that's going to be bad for NOx. So that means today's burners are much more complicated than they used to be. Before we cared about this, we just mix the fuel and air to make the flame shape that we wanted to get stability, to get all the properties without worrying about NOx. Question? So on the extreme case with 100% excess air, uh, you have more nitrogen because you have more excess air, right? But NOx is lower. So does that mean that the lower flame temperature like overrides the amount of nitrogen that, that you have? It does. So the question is, 
Here you have obviously a lot more nitrogen than you did here. So what's the dominating factor? Really at any of these conditions we have plenty of nitrogen. None of them are deficient in having nitrogen. There's a lot of it around. What we need though is high temperature to break that triple bond apart. So here cooling it down the, the more nitrogen is not the impact, it's cooler temperatures that reduce it. Good. All right, so again, the, the key is to make sure we don't have anything in that region. Here's some actual data and also a curve from the American Petroleum Institute. And what this is saying is that excess O2, which is related to excess air, can either raise it, lower it, or have not much of an impact. So the reason we like to show this is that sometimes API curve would lead you to believe that NOx always goes up with excess O2, and most of the time it does, but we have found some cases where that may not be the case. So obviously you need to test the exact equipment that you're going to do and the fuels you're going to have to make sure does it go up or does it go down. The other importance of this curve is that we visit a lot of plants, and a lot of them are running more excess O2 than we think they should. What's the problem? If you run more excess O2, that means your process is not as efficient because, again, it's carrying energy out the stack. It also means you're probably making more NOx. Now, why do they do that? They do it because their fuel changes, and they want to make sure they always have enough air. We understand that. What we tell them is just don't overdo it because you can overdo it and make it worse. <clears throat> the next one shows what happens to air preheat. Good for efficiency. So what folks will do is they'll take the hot gases coming out of the stack, they'll recycle them with another, usually another fan, they'll blow it through a heat exchanger and exchange heat with the combustion air coming in. In a glass furnace, how they melt sand, basically quartz, is with a really, really hot flame. How do they get a really, really hot flame? They preheat the combustion air to 2,000 degrees. They're preheating their air hotter than our process heaters are running at. Our process heaters run the furnace itself usually under 2,000 degrees. They're preheating the air to 2,000 degrees. Furnace is 3,000 degrees. Again, if you want to make NOx, that's how I tell you to do it. Now, they're obviously not doing it to make NOx, but they need a really hot flame to melt the sand. So they've had a lot of trouble. They need post-treatment equipment. Some of them have replaced their air with pure oxygen. And in that case, to go back to the earlier question, they've taken all the nitrogen out, or almost all of that. It depends on the purity of the oxygen they're using. It's expensive, but they get some other benefits too. So in this case, it's showing you that as you increase the air preheat temperature for any of the fuels, then your NOx goes up. This is something that you sometimes do have control over. You can control how much you preheat in some cases, not in a glass furnace, but in process heaters. So as an example, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, there's an Exxon Mobil plant there, and when they're going to have a bad ozone day, sometimes the state of Louisiana will call up Exxon and say, we want you to back off on your air preheat because tomorrow's going to be a bad ozone day. And they can do that. They'll suffer a little bit of efficiency, which you might say, well, wait a minute, if they back that off, they're going to have to fire a little bit harder, and that's true. But NOx is going up so fast with air preheat that you're still better off just to back off on the air preheat, even though you have to fire a little bit harder. So air preheat you sometimes can control. Not always, but sometimes. Hydrogen effects. So I told you that hydrogen burns with a hotter flame. And this is showing you hydrogen blended with methane. So on the left-hand side, it's pure methane. And on the right-hand side, it's pure hydrogen. And you can see that as you increase the hydrogen content, the NOx goes up because it's a hotter flame. Again, can you control this? Sometimes, sometimes not. We were at a plant last week where they have a hydrogen plant, and they can somewhat control how much hydrogen they dump into the fuel supply. But not everybody can do that. So if you can, then you do that. But when you have hydrogen in your fuel, that gets our attention for a lot of reasons. This is one of them especially if we have to make a guarantee on that. How about nitrogen effects on fuel? So this goes back to the earlier question. Does it matter where the nitrogen comes from? The answer is no, it doesn't. So 
In this case, though, if there's nitrogen in your fuel, and you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, nitrogen's not a fuel. It isn't, but it could be in your fuel. We said that Tulsa natural gas has a small amount in there, but some plants can have a lot more than that, and the more you have in the fuel, the better. We stop at 90% because if it was 100% nitrogen, that wouldn't burn, right? So 90%, the balance being methane, that will burn. So does that mean you should dump nitrogen into your fuel supply? You're laughing, and you should laugh. It's, it's a funny thing. You wouldn't do that on purpose. But an interesting story, we had a new technology we introduced hmm, probably about 15 years ago to a plant in Texas. At the time, it made the lowest NOx in the world. It ran for a year. About six months into the trial, we got a panicked call from the customer. Something's going on with your burners. They're going unstable. So the researcher talked to them. He couldn't understand what happened. He actually flew down there to find out what was going on. He couldn't find anything wrong. He said, do you guys measure your fuel gas composition? They said, yes. We never look at it, but yeah, we do measure it. <laughs> okay, can I see it? So he looks at it. When the burners went unstable, the nitrogen had spiked up to about 30%. He said, that's the problem. You guys never told us you were going to have nitrogen in your fuel, especially that much. The, the story that I heard was when the plant manager found out, he was ticked. He said, next time somebody dumps a lot of nitrogen in the fuel supply and doesn't tell anybody, they're going to be fired. You can't just do that kind of stuff because, again, burners went unstable. They could have gone out and they could have had an explosion. So dangerous to do that. So the message here is not that we should be dumping nitrogen in there on purpose, but if you have an inert like nitrogen or more likely like CO2, those are good for NOx. They're bad for other things, but they're good for NOx. Why? They cool the flame down. So in a hydrogen reformer, for example, the off gas has sometimes as much as 50% CO2 in it, but it still has hydrogen and CO. It's still a good fuel. And again, low NOx, not a problem. Flame stability is a problem because CO2, what do we use CO2 for? Fire extinguishers, right? So not so good for a flame, but good for NOx. And then here's one that shows you the effect of nitrogen that's organically bound in the fuel. And it basically says the more nitrogen organically bound in the fuel, the higher the NOx. And we've done some studies to show the same kind of formation. So again, we have to know exactly what is in the fuel oil if we're going to make a guarantee on that. How about ambient conditions like temperature and humidity? Do you think they have any impact on NOx? You might not think so. And I'll tell you some of our dirty laundry. When I first came to Zinc about 20 years ago, we would do some tests for customers. We would prepare for them to come in. The week before, we were close on the guarantee, but we made it. The customer would come in the next week, and we'd fail the test. And we couldn't figure out why. And we spent a lot of money fixing the problem. And it turned out that the ambient conditions had changed enough from the previous week to the current week that we were over our limit. So let me show you what happens. Well, first of all, if you tune up at a certain condition, so in this case, we tuned it up in the summer, high humidity, high temperature, and then we go to winter conditions. So what happens? Well, you have more oxygen per cubic foot, and our burners are volume devices. They don't go by mass. They go by how much volume will flow through there. So in the wintertime, you've got more oxygen in a cubic foot, right? That's good for breathing and for other things. But if the plant doesn't adjust for that, then their excess O2 goes up. And I showed you before that when excess O2 goes up, NOx goes up. And not all plants do this kind of adjustment. Some of them do, some of them don't. All right, so that's an issue. How about, again, when we saw before that when the excess O2 goes up, NOx can go up pretty significantly. And you didn't do anything. This is just nature, right? Do we control nature? If anybody says yes, then you should not be in this class. You should be out, outside making a gazillion dollars. We don't control nature, right? So we have to deal with whatever the conditions are. We can make adjustments, but if you don't make the adjustments, then that's the potential penalty. How about if you have more humid air? Does that help or hurt? Well, humid air means there's water, more water in the air. That water absorbs heat, lowers the flame temperature, and lowers NOx. So here we artificially humidified the air just to see what would happen, and you can see that. Again, do we control the air humidity? 
Well, this one we actually can. And the way I say that is we can spray water into the flame or into the burner to humidify the air if we want to, and some folks do that. Does injecting water into the flame reduce NOx? It does. Does it also reduce your efficiency? Usually it does. So you don't want to do too much of this, but if, let's say, the inspector's coming next week, you're close on your limit, maybe you're going to inject a little bit in there to make sure you don't exceed your limits. So humidity and temperature can have an impact. Now, how do we measure it? Well, we have a sample train that goes to an analyzer, and normally the good analyzers don't like wet, dirty, and hot samples. So we have a conditioner to cool them, to clean them, and to uh, make sure that they get into the analyzer so they're not dirty either, so filter them as well. So that's the conditioner here. Again, we're measuring in parts per million, so not a very concentrated amount, not a very high amount. Again, we're going to condition the sample, and this is an example of a typical train. In this case, when you measure it that way, we call that parts per million by volume on a dry basis, PPMVD. That's the proper way to say it. You will see plenty of them that will just be PPM. Technically, that's not enough. That doesn't tell you enough. Everybody assumes this is what they mean, but you won't always see that. But technically, this is the, the correct way to do it. Here's an example of what's called a chemiluminescent analyzer. This is one of ours in our test facility. And how it works is it has a reaction actually with ozone, O3, and it generates light that's proportional to how much NOx you have. So in this case, there's actually an ozone generator inside the device that makes ozone on purpose so that we can get that reaction. And again, we can get total NOx as well, so we can get NO and NO2 by measuring what's in the, coming in the sample. So one year, I went to a conference, this was back in 1994, and Knox was just kind of getting coming into its heyday, so starting to get really important. And I, this, at this conference, as I was looking through the papers, I was struck by how many different units people used to report Knox. So from my own curiosity, I went through every paper and got all of them, and there were actually 13 different units used to report Knox. So I told you before that PPM is really not correct. It doesn't tell you enough. You need to have was it on a volume basis, was it on a mass basis, was it on a wet basis, was it on a dry basis, and also was it corrected to a certain amount of O2. So that one, you can't really tell what it is. There are some mass units, volume units. Some of these are common for gas turbines because they run lots of extra O2. And there were some of them that were kind of uh, interesting, massive NOx per mass of dry fuel. So in this case, they had straw, rice, things like that. So it depended, again, on how they were trying to report it. The problem is, how do you compare them? How do you compare different units taken from different things? And sometimes that's hard to do. So we're going to talk about reporting NOx. And again, you're going to have a couple homework problems related to that. So many regulations today are written to correct the NOx measurement to a certain level of O2. And we're going to see why that is. So you have to measure what level of O2 that, that you had when you measured the NOx and then you correct it to whatever they tell you to, the most common one is 3%. <clears throat> so again, you need to record both of them. What's the NOx and what is the O2? So why do we have to do the correction? Well, there's a famous saying in the environmental community, the solution to pollution is dilution. What do we mean by that? Before the EPA caught on to this, what some folks did was they added lots of extra air to their exhaust. What happens when you add a lot of extra air? You dilute the sample. So instead of maybe having 50 ppm, maybe now you only have 20 because you've added all that extra air. Well, you didn't actually reduce the NOx, you just kind of tricked the reading. So they, they eventually figured that out and then, then they required folks to report it on a certain level. Here's an example of some documents from the EPA where if you can't measure it, then they have some standards that you could use. So one place where this is sometimes used is for flares. We're going to find out later on for flares, especially ones that are in the open, that's hard to measure what the NOx is. It's not contained. It's up high off in the air. 
So we will sometimes use these factors for things that are hard to measure. But, but today, we almost always measure it. All right, so here's a correction where we measure NOx a certain level of O2, and we have to report it in a different level. It could coincidentally be the same, but it typically is not. So what are those things? Well, we want to, what is the NOx measured? What's the O2 measured? What's the O2 reported? And then finally, what are we going to report to the regulators? So let's look at an example, 100 ppm at 5% excess O2, and we want to correct that to 3%. Now, based on what you know of volumes, you think the NOx number is going to go up or is it going to go down? Are we going to report more or less when we go to a lower concentration of excess O2? I hear a vote for more. Any votes for less? So Thomas is correct. It's going to be more. Why is that? Because less dilution. And again, that's the whole point of correcting it to a certain level because otherwise people could make this 6, 7, 8%. They could make the number really low. But that's not fair because they actually haven't made it low. They're just artificially making a smaller number. We sometimes also want to correct for temperature. This one, the last one was an official correction by the EPA. This one is an unofficial correction by John Zink. And why we have this is sometimes when we measure the, the temperature of our heater, it could be different than the temperature of the heater in the field that this equipment's going to go to. So we want to know if our temperature is not exactly the same as the temperature of the heater in the field, how would we correct it? And so this is our empirical correction you can't use it if it's too big of a difference, but if it's a reasonable difference, and when we say reasonable, we're saying if it's 400 degrees or, or less, really we'd prefer it to be less than that. Sorry, 200 degrees, the, the basis temperature is 400. So again, this is an empirical correction for our measurement compared to the temperature in the field. So here's an example, 20 ppm, 3% XSO2, 1800 degrees, and now same excess O2, but a higher temperature. So based on what I told you about temperature, do you expect this NOx number to go up or to go down with a higher temperature? Expect it to go up, right? We saw the curves that took off, and in fact, it will. So if you make the correction, it's going to be a higher number. And again, this is empirical. This is not an official thing for the EPA. This is something that we've learned. You can obviously combine both corrections, so if you hit correct for both temperature and excess O2, we have an example like that. And again, on your homework, you're going to have a, a few of these to do. Sometimes the regulators want you to report NOx in pounds of NOx per million BTUs. So that's a mass per unit of energy. And we'll see how you make that correction. The main pain in this one is calculating the total dry products. So in the back of these notes are the equations to do that. I'm not going to go through them here, but they are in the back. Uh, but if you know what those are, then it's a pretty easy calculation. So we know what the molecular weight is. We know what the conversion factor is. We measure a certain amount of NOx, and then it's an easy plug and chug. And you can see how the units work out. So again, as a reminder, Calculating the exhaust gas flows is in the back, which we won't cover, but it is in your notes. Also in the back of your notes are metric conversions. I'm giving you U.S. units that we typically use, but the rest of the world using metrics, so those are also in there as well. All right, so let's convert NOx from pounds per million to, or from uh, PPM to pounds per million. So in this case, this is what we measured. I'm telling you what the total dry products are, but for your cases, you'll have to calculate those. And then we plug the numbers in, and we get a number that we would report 0.03 pounds of NOx per million BTUs. And we can go from PPM to a mass unit per unit time. So sometimes the regulations are you're allowed to make so much NOx per day, per week, per month, per year. So then you'll do the appropriate calculation for that. Pretty similar, except now we put the firing rate in there in terms of time. And so you can see how all those units work. Here's an example of that, pounds per million, or PPM to pounds per hour, an example. And so you can see in this case, this would equate to three pounds per hour. So again, you'll have a couple of those. 
There's also an app you can download for free from John Zink. Its primary purpose is making these kinds of conversions. It also has a good unit converter. It's got some bizarre units in there, some of them I've never heard of. Didn't even know there were such units. So if you want to impress your friends, you can look up some weird units and say, hey, you know how many feet are in this thing, weird thing? So uh, that's in there too. So again, it's free if, you, if you're interested. Okay. Last thing that I want to spend most of our time on is reducing NOx. So you've seen a little bit of the theory, you've seen how it forms, you've seen what are some of the factors that influence it, now how do we reduce it? Well, last time Stephen told you about four general strategies for reducing NOx. The first one is pretreatment where you do something to what's coming into the process. The next one is combustion modification. That's mostly what I'm going to talk about, although I'm going to give you examples of all of them. The third one is process modification. Is there anything you can do to the process to reduce NOx? And then the last one, really the, the least one that you want to have to do, if, if at all possible, is we've got to scrub it out after we've already made it. So let's talk about some examples of these. So pretreatment, again, it's switching something on the incoming or doing something to what's coming in. And an example would be, and we've done this in a big way in the United States, switch from firing oil to firing gaseous fuels. We said before that oil's got some organically bound nitrogen in it. That's bad for NOx. So by switching to a fuel that doesn't make as much pollution, then we can reduce NOx. Is this economical? Answer is it is. In fact, that's why people switched, because it was getting too expensive to clean up the mess that you made firing oil. Now, is oil still fired? Yes, I gave you a couple examples in the US, but it's fired mostly in South America. I think that's the, the primary fuel they fire. It's fired in the Middle East, it's fired in the Far East, a little bit in Europe, not so much. Not so much in North America, although there are places, but not so much. So we can do this, and in this case, it's economical to do it, and we have done it. So that's an example of switching something or changing something on the incoming. How about less polluting raw materials. Well, in the U.S., about 10 years ago, lots of plants were putting in what are called cokers. A coker costs more than a billion dollars. One billion. Now, why were they putting those cokers in? So they could fire heavy oil and process that. Now, why would you want to do that? Because it's cheap. That heavy crude is cheap because it's not such a great fuel. It's not such a great one because it requires lots of processing, lots, of, lots more energy. So this would be the, what, what people refer to as the sour crude. When you fire sweet crude or when you process sweet crude, you don't need as much energy. It doesn't have such nasty stuff in it. It's cheaper process, but as you can imagine, it's more expensive to buy. So again, this is the balance. If you could then switch to sweet crude, you would need less energy to make that into gasoline or jet fuel or diesel or naphtha or anything else. So that would be cheaper, but again, you need to pay more for the raw material. Another possibility is to remove the nitrogen from the air. Fire oxy fuel, pure oxygen and fuel. Now, why is that good for NOx? Basically, you've taken away the source of nitrogen to make NOx. Does this work? It does. Is this expensive? It is. Normally, this only makes sense for higher temperature applications, like in a steel mill or a glass plant or aluminum plant. Typically, it doesn't make economic sense in a refinery process heater. However, it has been done and we've done it. There was a trial done, I believe about five or so years ago, they ran this at a refinery in Texas. They never published the results. I think the reason, and this is just my guess, the reason why they never published the results is they were really good. NOx was really low, but it's not economical. So what does Uncle Sam do when he hears it's good for pollution even though it's expensive? He doesn't care about the cost, right? The government doesn't always care how much it costs. Ah, we can make less pollution. We're going to make you do that. So. I believe the plant didn't want the government to know that because then the government might have made them do it. We also did it a few years ago 
and we were funded in part by a consortium of major oil companies around the world. Interesting what they wanted to know. They wanted to know if they used pure oxygen in the burners they already had in place, so not special burners, but the ones they already had in place, would it work? We found out that yes, we could make that work. What we did was we recycled the O2 and CO2, sorry, the CO2 and water into the oxygen and we kind of made pseudo air. The air was oxygen, CO2, and water, no nitrogen. And we found out you can make this work. Now, why did they want to know if it would work? They wanted to know if someday their governments, and again, these were from around the world, not just the U.S., they wanted to know if their governments ever came to them and said, you guys need to capture your CO2, could they do it? Now, here's the deal. When you fire oxygen, pure oxygen, with your fuel, you make CO2 and water as your combustion products. No nitrogen, right? You condense out the water, and now you've got basically a pure stream of CO2. That's what they wanted to know. Could this work? The answer is yes. Is it economical? No, it isn't. But if the government says they have to do it, it doesn't matter if the economics work or not. So you can do this but it's today not economical. Now, you can imagine, and I used to work for an oxygen supply company, the oxygen supply companies would love this to happen. They would build plants right next to the refinery because they would be supplying so much oxygen, so they would love it. But the refineries may not love it so much because it's going to cost a fair amount of money. So some of these are economical, some of them are not, some of them make sense. Technically, they all work, but they're not all economical. How about remove nitrogen from the fuel gas? So in the case of natural gas, we said that sometimes it has it in there. It's not very much. Frankly, technically we can do this. Economically, it makes no sense at all. If you had nitrogen in, in your fuel oil, again, we can technically take it out, but it's almost never economical to do it. So all options doesn't mean they all make sense, but they are all technically options. Process modification, so this is the second strategy. Really the best one, if you can do it, is to make your process more energy efficient. Why? Because you burn less fuel. When you burn less fuel, you make less pollution. So I'll give you an example. If you go to a glass plant where they're making flat glass for windows and, and cars and things like that, a well-run plant, you will not hear much glass breaking. A poorly run plant, you'll hear glass breaking all the time. Now, why is that? Well, the flat glass comes through the line. It's got an optical scanner that looks at it, and it's looking for imperfections. It's looking for what they call seeds, bubbles in the glass, which can explode if you try to sell it to somebody. So the sensors look at it, and if it's bad, then they have hammers that literally break the glass, and then they feed the glass back in, and it starts all over again. So a poorly run plant, you hear glass breaking all the time. And what does that mean for your energy consumption? Well, it's not very good because you keep reprocessing the same stuff over and over again. In our industry, it would be if you processed sweet crude versus sour crude. Sweet crude, you need less energy to process it, whereas sour crude, you need more. So in some cases, it, it works. In some cases, it doesn't. But overall, you always want to try to make your process energy efficient because you save on fuel and you save on pollution. How about switching from fossil fuels to electricity for heating? Well, if you use electricity, you don't make any knocks at the point of use. Obviously, to generate the electricity, somebody made knocks back at the power plant, but within your fence line, that's good, right? Here's the problem that electricity depending upon how you produce it and your cost of fuels is usually on the order of five times more expensive than using fossil fuels. So very few people are going to do this because it doesn't make economic sense. You could do it. Technically it works. But again, not so good from an economic perspective. All right. So we're going to spend most of our time on this one, which is modifying the combustion in some way to reduce NOx. And this is really the business for John Zink. We've been in this business probably more than 30 years now looking at what can we do to reduce NOx. 
we're probably one of the few companies that actually likes it when the government makes the regulations tougher because then our customers have to buy more equipment. Customers aren't always so wild about that, so we can't appear like we're encouraging the government to do that. But we're always making new technologies. We've got actually a new burner that's just was has just been developed. It's not even been commercialized yet that will have the lowest NOx in the world. Our target market is California. Other places don't need that yet. The NOx regulations in Oklahoma, frankly, are not that tough. We are years behind Texas and even further behind California because we don't have a lot of plants. We have pretty flat land. We have wind that sweeps it out so it does not accumulate in Oklahoma. But in Texas, where they have lots of plants, it's an issue. In California, not only do they have quite a few plants, but their geography also is not very conducive for getting rid of NOx. So all these things are things that we have actually developed, and many of them are in technologies today. First one is called staging. So here's a normal flame, very hot. This was pre-1970. This is what we did. This is what these burners are. When I used to talk about this, I used to say these are the high NOx burners. But my management said that John Zink does not make any high NOx burners. These are conventional burners. They're just old, right? When we didn't care about NOx, we didn't measure it. If you can stretch out the flame, then you can stretch out where the energy is released and you have cooler flame overall. No less efficient, but it's a longer flame. So the question is, can you tolerate a longer flame? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So again, you've stretched it out, same amount of energy release, so no less efficient, but we've just stretched it out. And but what we're trying to do is get rid of the hot spots in the flame. So let's look at staging the air. In this case, we put some of the air in the beginning of the flame, and then we put the rest of the air downstream. This was the first generation of burners when folks were still firing oil because they used air and you could control the air better than you could control the oil. Here's a little cartoon of what it looks like. So we put all the fuel in the middle, we put some of the air into the primary zone, and then the rest, <clears throat> rest of it down the stream. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can do this as much as you want. This is just showing you two of them, but it could even be more than that. Here's a foot drawing of a burner that can do that. This one's got multiple air controls. This one was designed for firing on oil. Here's a picture or drawing of one for a gaseous fuel. And then here's a drawing and a picture of one firing in a furnace that has staged air. So again, stretching out the flame so that you don't get the hot spots in there. Then folks started phasing out oil in the United States and went to gas. So then it was easier to stage the fuel because they had pretty decent pressure on their fuel. So without staging, we've got that. With staging now, we put some of the fuel in the primary zone and we put the rest of it further downstream. If you look at the cartoon, it's the exact opposite. We've got the air in the middle, a little bit of fuel coming in, in the primary zone, and the rest of the fuel downstream. Here's an example of a staged fuel burner. The air is coming in on the left-hand side. That's the blue. The red is the fuel. This is the primary injector. This one is a pilot. And these are staged fuel injectors for injecting it downstream. If you look at the flame, you can see the staged fuel injectors. So again, the flame is stretched out, and you don't have the hot spots in the flame. You can see that the temperature of the flame is pretty uniform, or the color of the flame is, is quite uniform. Now, do these things work? Conventional burners around 100 ppm, again, pre-1970, firing on gas. First generation was staged air reduced it from 100 down to roughly about 60. When folks stopped firing oil in the U.S., then they went to gaseous fuels, and so we staged that fuel now from 100 down to about 30. And today in the U.S., every ultra-low NOx burner that I, that I know of uses this as one of its techniques. All right? Next thing we discovered was diluting the flame. I told you before that you can spray water into the flame. That works. 
but not very good for efficiency. Better than that is to actually recycle furnace gases into the flame. So here's one example of that. This one is called fuel-induced recirculation. So we've got a high-velocity jet of fuel. We've got combustion product coming off the heater, and they're recycled into the fuel. So those furnace gases mix with the fuel, and when we fire them, we reduce the NOx. Now, at first, that might not sound like it makes sense because we said before air preheat is bad. So these gases, they're not real hot, but they're a few hundred degrees at least. Why would we mix those with the fuel? Well, those gases are cooler than the flame, and that's the key. So they actually make the flame, again, more uniform in temperature and reduce the NOx. A better way even than that is what we call flue gas recirculation, where you take furnace gases out of the stack, recycle them, through the burner and reduce the NOx again, getting the hot spots out of the flame, making the flame more uniform in temperature. Here's an example of the data that says when we did that fuel-induced recirculation, pretty dramatic reduction in NOx. However, you start to get to the point where you dilute it so much that the flame doesn't burn anymore. So we can't continuously do this because if you get too low, the flame's going to go unstable. So there's a limit to how much you can do. So here's some graphs of two different kinds of burners. One's called a premix and one's called a raw gas. The premix burner is more like the conventional flame or the conventional calculations. The fusion flame just means it's a delayed mixing. And you can see that in both cases, the peak for NOx is near stoichiometric conditions. We can't lean it out any more than this or the flame will go out. It won't burn anymore. So that's kind of our limit. Now, if you looked at one of those flames, in this case the diffusion flame, and you recycle gases into it, it pushes the whole curve down. That's good. You can look at the same thing for premix, and if you do that recirculation, again, it pushes the whole curve down. And today, again, this is one of the techniques that's in every ultra low NOx burner that I'm familiar with. This one is just showing you both all those four curves together. All right, so what I showed before was taking it off of the stack and piping it around back through the burner. That requires extra duct work. It has to be insulated duct work because it's hot gas. You need a fan to do that. A better way to do it is what we call infernox, in furnace NOx reduction. You do the recycle inside the furnace. You don't have external duct work. You don't have another fan. Much cheaper and actually very effective. And we patented this too. Here's an example of one of those kinds of burners. By having high velocity jets of fuel, you entrain those furnace gases. So there's one of them. Here's another one. Here's an example in a test furnace where we could get down as low as single digits. We wouldn't guarantee this in the field, but you can see how low you can get. And here's a photograph of one of those flames, and you can look how uniform that temperature is. If you are a Picasso of flames, that is a Picasso of flames. That's a beautiful flame. Look at how uniform that is. Very low NOx. Here's some different embodiments. Sometimes we fire them in round burners, sometimes rectangular burners, sometimes in the middle of the floor, sometimes against the wall. A variety of configurations. Did that work? We're even lower. Now we're about 90% reduction. All right, let's talk about some next generation technologies. First one is what's called flameless combustion. That sounds like an oxymoron. How can you have flameless combustion? What it means is that our human eyes can't see the flame. It doesn't mean there isn't a flame, it just means we can't see it. The most extreme embodiment of that is to have the fuel on one side of the heater and the air on the other, and they mix completely inside the box. The problem with that is it's dangerous. If this thing is not above auto ignition, you're making a bomb. So industry is very leery about doing this but I'm going to show you some data that shows it does work. All right, so they mix separately. 
Okay. So very dilute. However, you normally need something to heat the furnace up above auto ignition before you can switch to this mode because it, it can be dangerous. Two big benefits, really low NOx and very uniform heating. Instead of doing the extreme embodiment, we can do something we call quasi-flameless. We've separated them. They're not at opposite ends of the heater, but they are separated somewhat. And I'm going to show you something that we discovered by accident that turned out to be something that we ended up patenting. So we bought a company in Germany that makes thermal oxidizers. They do not have as nice a test facility as we have, so we took their main burner that they used, we brought it to Tulsa, and we tested it just to see what it could do. And one day, the engineers and the technicians were coming down from a set of tests, and they hit a condition where the NOx analyzer said about zero. Well, the first reaction was, that's wrong. Can't be that low. There's something wrong with the analyzer. Let's recalibrate it. Just for the heck of it, let's check it again. So they checked the calibration. Calibration was okay. Repeated it. Same thing again zero. They kept doing it over and over again and they kept getting almost zero. This was completely an accidental discovery. We did, they didn't even know what was going on. They didn't believe it at first. They thought there had to be something wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a video. It's only a few minutes. This actually took about a half an hour, but I'm, I cut everything out. So we started out at 32 ppm and a furnace temperature of almost 1800. There are three videos that are playing simultaneously. The first one is the one I want you to watch at the beginning. So here's the flame. When we switch to flameless, this is going to disappear. So you will not see a flame anymore. Now you might think, oh, okay, well the furnace must be cooling down, right? Actually the furnace temperature went up. Not a lot, but it went up a little bit. But look what happened to the NOx, below 1 ppm. You're going to see also that this was really quiet. This was somewhat unnerving to the guys who were there doing the test. It was so quiet they thought it went out because they couldn't hear it anymore. And then you might say, well, okay, maybe the NOx was really low, but the CO must have been bad, right? Nope. CO was zero. Never went high. And then you'll see this, the, the big video. The guys are walking around. That's for show. They're not doing anything. They're just walking around. So, again, you're going to see a jump. You'll see the numbers start to go down, and then you'll see a jump. That's where I've cut out a big chunk just so we don't have to... Watch that whole thing. Oh, good grief, it's not playing. So, okay. I, Stephen had the same problem. It plays when, when it's not connected to the TV. I don't know what's the problem. But in any case, you, you would see that the flame would disappear. So we still had a flame. It was still firing, and it actually heated up, but you didn't see it anymore. And then we got to very low NOx. Now, what's been the problem with commercializing this technology? When you have something so radically different, the customer's perspective is, that's great. I'll be number 20 to do it, but I'm not going to be number 1 through 19. You find some other people to try it first, and then I'll jump on the bandwagon. So that's the hard part, even though this is pretty phenomenal, less than 1 ppm. And again, accidental, and we patented this. Here's another one. This is the only flameless combustion technology that I know of in the United States today, and it's at a plant in Coffeyville, Kansas. We actually, by coincidence, happened to be there the last two weeks doing some training. Let's see if this video works. Okay, I'm going to figure out why these aren't playing because they play at home. This one actually is swirling around you can see the flame here, but you can't see the flame further on. And this one's been running, I think, for about four years now. And it's doing great on NOx. Now, why did this customer agree to do it when most would not? They made a deal with the EPA. EPA said, we're going to cut you some slack if you try this new thing. So that's the only reason they're doing it. It's also in a small heater that's not a big thing on their production. So if something went wrong, it wouldn't impact them very much. But nobody else has agreed to try it, even though it's been working for four years. So this is the challenge when you have something that's radically different. Remote fuel staging. This is one. Actually, I'm going to jump to the next one. This is in an ethylene furnace. These are what are called radiant wall burners. 
We had a fuel injector at the bottom, so this is actually looking up the side wall. There was a fuel injector separate from the burners, and this one is also a patented technology, and this one is commercialized because it's not so radically different. They still have their normal burners, they just have an extra few fuel injectors to do that. We also said that when you run close to the lean limit, you make low NOx. Why? Because it's cooler temperatures there, right? So we developed a technology some years ago called Cool Mix, and we did some tests and we got very low NOx in a hot furnace. So the, in ethylene, the furnaces are pretty hot. Depended obviously on the temperature and the fuel, but we could get very low. Typically, the NOx in these furnaces is 30 to 50 ppm, so considerably lower. Then what we did was we did an array of tests in one of our heaters because one of the things we found out is that ultra-low NOx burners interact with each other, and the NOx that we measured in our test furnace was a lot lower than it turned out to be in the field. That's a problem, obviously, when you're trying to make a guarantee. So what we found out was that single burner test, we got that. That multi-burner test you saw on the previous slide, we got about double that. And in field measurements, sometimes as much as triple. So we had to know what was the conversion from single to multi to actual furnace measurements. So here's some of them you can see. Again, these are ethylene furnaces, hotter temperatures. They're a minimum of 2,000 degrees. In these furnaces, they try to heat up the wall to radiate to the tube. So I don't know how well you can see it, but here are the tubes on this one, and the tubes are just out of the picture on this one. And again, to make plastics. So here's another example where we did a retrofit, and this one was kind of fascinating. This one was for a, well, actually, I can say the name of it because we published this. This was for Chevron in Richmond, California. They came to us about hmm, 15 or so years ago and said they needed to dramatically reduce their NOx. Otherwise, they were going to have to buy a, a, some expensive post-treatment equipment. So keep an eye on this. I'm going to show you the after. So this is the before. And these burners are actually firing in tunnels. So they're firing in tunnels across the floor. There's a little wall you can't see out of the picture, and it's radiating to these tubes. So what was fun about this is that Chevron would fly back to Tulsa about every month or two to see what we did, say, we like that, we don't like that, fix this, change that. And so we worked with them, and we came up with one to retrofit on the fly. So this, we don't like to do this, change burners while the heater's still running but we did it because they, they didn't have a turnaround coming up soon, so they wanted to run. So they just did two of them to see anything we missed, anything we just flat out made a mistake. Everything worked fine, so we did that, and we just did two of them. Then we did a replacement. We replaced 32 of them, and I think this heater had 256 total. So again, this is just to see, do, are we doing anything that's going to shut the heater down? And so they replaced these, again, on the fly while the heater was running. They're taking a burner out. It's still hot in there, putting another one in. Obviously, we made it so it would bolt into the same pattern. That worked. So then they replaced the whole heater. And even replacing only 32 of them out of 256, they got a dramatic reduction. We got more of them to replace all of them. This, this plant has a bunch of big heaters. Here's another one. You can see, so this one is a, a terrace wall heater. All right, so here's the, the, the one that I really want you to see. This is a different heater. The last one you saw, they were round tun or square tunnels. These are round tunnels. That's the before, and here's the after. If you are a maestro of combustion, this should be on everybody's wall. It's that good. This, you should be giving this to people for Christmas presents. It's, it's that good more than a 90% reduction. Here's something that we didn't plan on, and I would not say this always happens, but this one, they could actually fire the heater harder than this one because all these hot spots, they were limited or they were gonna damage the floor. Because this was so uniform, they actually increased their production, which more than paid for the retrofit. Now, if we had known that, we would have charged them more, but we didn't know that. And again, does that always happen? No but sometimes it does, and that's, that's a great example. So here, change 228 burners, 250 megawatts. Again, it's a big heater. So here's the history. 
coming down, down, down. Pretty big reduction. Now this is not intended to brag about John Zink. This is intended to say that technology has done a pretty good job reducing pollution. Here's an example for a different style of burner. Why I like to show this is sometimes you'll hear the environmental folks, they get on their high horse and they'll, they'll, they would have you to believe that our air is dirtier today than ever. That's not true. It's a lie. Our air today is cleaner than when I was a kid. That's a fact. Go on EPA's website. They've been measuring ambient air quality in every major city since 1970. The data is all there. Because of this, because our car engines are cleaner, because ga uh, gas turbines are cleaner, all that stuff is cleaner. Now, I get it. I'm with the environmentalists. We don't want any pollution. When it's zero, then we're done. It's not zero yet, so we're not done. But I just think sometimes they paint a picture that's just not truthful. NOx and other pollutants have come down dramatically because of technology. All right, last thing then is post-treatment. I'm not going to spend any time on this because that's what Steve's going to talk about on Thursday. But this is equipment that you have after the fact. You made too much with your combustion, now you got to remove some. Pretty expensive stuff. It's got a lot of issues related to it, but it does work. In California, every plant has this kind of equipment in it. In some plants, they also have it. In fact, the plant we were at in Coffeyville, they actually have one of these in there too. Uncle Sam has funded a lot of studies to say, what's the cheapest way to reduce NOx? They all say the same thing. Don't make it in the first place. If you have to take it out after the fact, it's much more expensive. In fact, it's about an order of magnitude more expensive. But in California, they can't always get low enough with the burners, so they may have to have this post-treatment equipment. All right, so just to summarize, we talked about lots of problems with NOx. Industrial emissions are primarily those two. The main mechanisms are these three. Temperature is a big deal, so the techniques are related to that. Here are some of the techniques to reduce NOx. So a couple of review questions to see if you were paying attention. What type of NOx is usually in the highest concentration coming out of the stack? Number one. We, we convert it to number two for reporting purposes in some cases, but that's the highest. How about what NOx mechanism is highly dependent on temperature? Thermal, that's where the name comes from. As humidity increases, what happens to NOx? It goes down. Good. You guys were listening. Awesome. If NOx was measured at 100 ppm at 2%, what would it be at 3%? Would it be more than 100, less than 100, or equal to 100? Less. Again, solution to dilution is pollution. Sorry, solution to pollution is dilution. Blending hot furnace gases into flame typically increases, decreases, or no impact on NOx. decreases. Again, we're blending it on purpose to get it more uniform. Operating near the upper or lower flammability limit typically increases, decreases, or has no impact on NOx. Decreases. No safety concerns with flameless combustion. False, unfortunately. NOx measured in single murder tests is usually higher than, lower than, or the same as in the field tests. Lower. All right, here's your homework. This is part A. You can do this on Excel if you want to, and then just send me the spreadsheet. These are pretty simple conversions. And here's the second part of it. Again, if you want to do them on Excel, that's fine. Send them to me. Here's my email address, and you have one week from today for that. Again, the rest of the slides tell you how to calculate total dry product and also metric if you ever need that in the future. Any questions? Everybody good? All right, we'll see you Thursday. Ask Dakota if they're still online and they heard that. South Dakota, are you still online? Can you did you hear that? All right, cool. Thanks. They heard it. <laughs>